So are we having a discussion on mastery and surrender? This is kind of a positional archive that I find very useful, teaching it to people who are doing stroking as well as to people who are doing video assembly. It's a good uh, model to have in mind. So I figured, uh, Evangeline wanted me to pick a topic for my new curriculum and have a talk about it. I figured this would be a good one. Yeah? Yes. So this is uh, these are the few pages from the 64 page and I posted. So I figured we would just go through this and see if it makes any sense to you people and we can talk about it. How does it sound? Sure. Yeah. Well, let me just, uh, you guys read and we'll talk about it. We'll start it off. Mm -hmm. Master Surrender Dynamic. Master and Surrender are positional roles that we are all playing all the time whenever we are either serving someone with a skill we possess, master position, or we are being served, surrender position by someone else pouring their mastery into us. Common examples of this polarized relating the master surrender dynamic, teacher, student, parent, child, surgeon, patient, chef, diner, musician, performer, audience, stroker, strokee, pilot, passenger, police. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, any questions? Cool, keep reading. Give me Go ahead, Positional characteristics. Energy, attention, and mastery moves from the master position to the surrender position. This transfer of attention, energy, and mastery is what service is. The person in the master position serves the person in the surrender position. Pilot serves the passengers. Chef serves the dinner. Diner. Diner. Musician serves the audience. Surgeon serves the patients. Stroker serves the strokey. Da, when in active, or handling mode serves the submissive. Submissive when in service mode and thus mastery mode serves the job. Any questions, any thoughts? Questions, comments? I have a question. Yeah. Um, what would, so how would you further describe that um, saying submissive when is in, in the service mode is then serving the dog? Um, how, how is service mode related to mastery mode? I want to kind of distinguish the two. That's the whole reason I created two conversations. In my BDSM class, I go straight into the DOM sub archetypes, but I think the DOM sub archetypes are much more personal. They're much more personality based, personal archetypical based. Master surrender are positions that we're all playing all the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, and this is the point where people often get confused when they uh, explore BDSM. Sorry. They think, uh, or when they have ideas about, well, I'm such a dom in my real life, but in my bedroom, I want to be a sub. I think it's easier to just to kind of separate the bedroom from real life, the personal and the erotic, from the rest of the time when you're holding the master position. So it's kind of a good point of distinction that if you are in the active mode, if you are handling somebody else, you are in the master position. So within the dom sub dynamic, if usually people think of that dynamic as a submissive coming and being the receptive party and the dom being the active party, which is usually how scenes generally start. And in that case, yes, the dom is holding the master position and the submissive is holding the surrender position. But it is an inherent to the dominance of archetype. That's the kind of distinction I really wanted to make. Yeah. Master position is not conjoined with the dom position. And the surrender position is not conjoined with the submissive position. Usually it's just the starting point of a relationship. But in fact, for a dom sub dynamic to be uh, balanced and thriving, the submissive should go into master mode, into pouring out mode, and pour energy back into the dom, and let the dom receive and be in the surrender mode. So if you if you separate these two things, it'll clarify a lot of confusion. You think, well, is the dom being a submissive when he or she is receiving service? No. If the dom were being a submissive, they would be switching their archetype. That's a different transition. Versus the sub trying to dom from underneath, right. which is smooshing. Which again right? is a different it's dynamic. Different. Yeah, you yeah. can very much simply hold your dom archetype, you can very much hold your submissive archetype, 
And in either position, you can be the active party or the receptive party. Mm -hmm. And if you make that distinction clear, a lot of confusion will go away. Mm -hmm. You're not changing your erotic archetype, you're not changing your erotic signature. You are changing how energy is flowing at any given moment. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to switch from down to sub and sub to down to balance out your relationship, but you do need to switch from master to surrender to balance out your relationship. If energy is always flowing from one person to another and never going in the opposite direction, the person who's pouring out energy will get exhausted. Yeah. And it doesn't matter whether that's happening in the DS context, it, it mm -hmm. can be in a relationship, it can be in a non-DS relationship, it can be in a parent-child relationship, any relationship which is not balanced, in which, unless it's a transactional relationship. If you're going to eat in a restaurant, you're always in a certain position somebody but you're giving them money and that's your exchange if it is a personal relationship and there's an imbalance between how the energy is flowing if you are the person holding space all the time for other people and doing it well but nobody's ever holding space for you you will burn out and get resentful after a while <laughs> what i mean does that mean you don't enjoy holding space for other people right a common example of this i give is you know, let's say you enjoy cooking, you love having friends over for dinner, and you love hosting dinner parties, great. But even when you do that, even though it's your pleasure to do it, when you host a dinner party, at the end of it, you are tired. You have spent a lot of energy, you have spent your time, you probably spent money, and you have poured out your mastery, your, your hosting, and your cooking, and your love, to your friends, and that's great, you enjoy doing it. But if you're the only one in your circle hosting dinner parties week after week after week after week, and nobody ever invites you out to dinner or makes an offer to you, eventually you will think, What is wrong with my friends? <laughs> it won't feel good after a while. And the exchange does not need to be even. Maybe your joy is cooking, and you cook for friends, and your friends. Pleasure might be somebody else. They give you a great seat to the opera or whatever their pleasure is. But they even it out saying, I want to give something to you. Tonight's not me. Let me take you on a ride. Let me show you something. And that balance is kind of, to me, the signature of a thriving, well-balanced relationship. It's actually better when two people bring different masteries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It can be richer. It's fine if... You love cooking and you cook for me and I love cooking and I cook for you. That also works fine. But you know, it could be something entirely different. You could introduce me to a world. You're like, oh, I'm going to take you square dancing. Like, <laughs> and I go and I may enjoy it. You know, a world I may never explore on my own. Something like that. But that balance of people realizing when is energy being poured into me and when am I returning that energy? I feel is one of the crucial things, certainly in the dance of dynamic, but also in relationships. You know, you can, you can uh, feel into your own last breakup, your own last relationship misery. Whatever terms people use, in some form they will express, both of them usually will say in some form, I feel I am giving a lot more than I'm getting back. Right? Neither person is feeling well taken care of. And that's kind of, that's breakdown right there. When both parties are feeling burnt out, where both parties are feeling unappreciated for what they bring into the relationship, which means my mastery is simply not being appreciated, it's not being received, and I don't feel any nourishment coming towards me, in which case, what's the point of being together anymore? If you're not here to handle each other and to enrich each other, to put our attention and energy into each other, what are we doing in this relationship? Mm -hmm. Good? Yeah. All right, let's keep going. It's a very rich conversation to me. Let's see if it makes sense to you. Read the next paragraph. So the viewer is next. Mastery and service. Thank you. Sit her down, give her a hand. By mastery and service. You can only serve from a position of mastery. You can only give to others what you really, really have. Whatever you're really good at is what you have. That thing you spend your 10,000 hours on is your mastery. 
Serve others with your mastery. Be a servant to the world through that which you are masterful at. That is the that is a life of purpose and engagement. So this first sentence, I'm not trying to be clever or to be confusing. When I say you can only self serve from a position of mastery, I know it sounds a little cheeky, but it's like the best way I can actually put it. Once you kind of absorb it, you will realize it's very true. We have a lot of prejudice against the idea and the word service. We don't really like the word servant anymore, certainly not in the West. Somebody is a maid, somebody is a helper, somebody is an assistant, they're not a servant. I want to bring servant back. I think there's actually a clarity in it. If you are the one pouring energy out, if you are the one serving somebody, you are the servant. And from this equation, the servant is not a menial position, right? All the master positions we described, teacher, parent, surgeon, chef, musician, chauffeur, pilot, police, they're all servants, right? When the police car says on its side to protect and to serve, they're also not being cheeky, they mean it, right? We have, we have a lot of, uh, let's leave our complaints aside, let's leave our ideas of police are horrible, politicians are horrible, let's, let's look at the good archetype, right? When the policeman is good, when the politician is honorable, they are servants, they are public servants, right? Even the surgeon is serving the patient. You may not refer to a surgeon as a servant, but it actually would be clarifying if you do. The musicians are serving the audience, the chef is serving the diners. The parent is serving the ch children by providing them with the container they need in which they can thrive. And you can only serve with that which you're good at, right? If I'm really a lousy cook, I should not be hosting dinner parties, <laughs> right? I'm not good at it. it, so it doesn't really make sense. If I don't know how to play the guitar, I should not ask for a captive audience and then pull out my guitar. It's going to be, uh, you know, not going to be a great time. <laughs> so that logic of it, that you can only serve from a position of mastery, you can only serve with that which you are really good at. You can only serve with that that you actually spend a lot of time acquiring mastery in. Because the, the prejudice we have against service is, well, if you're in service mode, you're doing something that anybody can do. Right? We think service is like clean the dishes, or anyone can clean the dishes. Nobody wants to clean the dishes, so get a servant to clean the dishes. And I think it's a really bad, bad model of what service and the servant archetype is. It isn't about menial jobs, it's about whatever jobs you're really, really good at. If you're doing that, and if you're doing that, and other people are benefiting from it, you are serving them. And by definition, if you're serving them, you're holding the servant position. And where are you best trained to hold that position? That which you have mastery at, that which you're really, really good at. Right? If I can do something that none of you can do, and I pour that into you, that is a good exchange. Right? If, I, if, I have, if I have it to give, and it is your pleasure to receive it, that's a good exchange. And in that exchange, I would be serving you, I would be your servant. Doesn't mean you're going to treat me like a menial person, but I would be your servant. I mean, it's actually a lovely expression. It's it's kind of English. The English still use it. You know, it could be something like something. The you know, big fan of Western. Any fans of Western over here? No. no. <laughs> what is? We it? also don't ride right, right horses. But you know, it's like I remember. You know, but the Brits will say like. At your service, or your servant, sir. You know, there was mm -hmm. an exchange where the president thanks the British ambassador for helping him out with the crisis. And he just bows and says, Your servant, sir. And you know that expression. Mm -hmm. And they mean it. Like, it is my pleasure that I was able to serve you. Mm -hmm. That I have some expertise that you could use in this crisis. Absolutely, at your service. Or they will say something like, I serve with the pleasure of the president. Mm -hmm. I am mm -hmm. your servant. Command me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you're stupid or you're menial. You're, in fact, very elite select group of people who are qualified to do that. But still, in that position, in that mastery, you are at service. You're giving service. So my desire for people is to really connect 
because we don't have you know endless areas of mastery most of us are good at if you're good at one thing that's a good start if you're good at two or three things in different areas of your life wonderful but realize those are your great entry points for creating relationships for being useful in this world for making money for having other people find you of value and uh, yeah be useful to people and they will keep you around that's a good thing we want to help any questions all of this really applies to relationships and sex by the way right it's just one level removed we will tie will tie it into relationships and sex but i feel this the conversation is bigger than that yeah the relationship is like a smaller circle that fits into this bigger circle of mastery and surrender which applies pretty much throughout our life good yeah. yes yeah Okay, so with the note of service, like I, I, you know, I'm familiar with this this sort of view of it before, and I feel like I've been working on finding more pleasure, in it, especially as like I was in for the past year, and I was like, okay, I'm here to do what you need me to do. Yeah. And within relationships, like it, it feels quite safer for me to be like, I'm gonna totally give all my love to this child, and um, I feel like. Safer doing that yeah. than in the context of relationship, and just be like, I will do anything for you. What do you want? I feel so secure that I will be seen as like, I guess maybe it's even ironic, but like more masculine. Like mm-hmm. I'll serve you, and and but I'm still kind of, I still want them to serve me too. And I know I take a lot of like, just like ease and like glee and pleasure in someone who wants to be like, what do you need? What do you want? And so. I feel like I can't figure out, I haven't figured out yet, like what's the balance of when I, I guess, I feel safe to give right. in a relationship. Well, I would say the balance is when you feel you are with somebody in which the energy exchange is even. And I think if you're, if you become clear in this, you will be able to see that earlier and faster, and you will also be able to make requests or if necessary, make demands that that energy flow be equal from early on and stuff. If you're not even familiar that this happening, all that happens over a long period of time is you just get really fatigued. You just have this overall sense of disenchantment in a relationship, like something is not working, I don't even know why. But, so that's one thing, the energy balance. But apart from that, I would say stay with this conversation a bit. I am not speaking generically about just giving yourself away to somebody and having them give themselves away to you. I'm actually speaking very specifically of give somebody something you're really good at. It's not about just doing what somebody is asking you to do. And if, you're, if you are approaching it from a position of mastery, your entire satisfaction is not come from the acknowledgement of the other, even though that's important. Part of your satisfaction is simply being in your mastery. What I mean, and when you're doing that, things are really singing. Mm -hmm. So yes, if you want to be a professional musician, of course you want to get up on stage and you want to be able to hold this audience and ideally you want them to pay money to come see you. But hopefully this exchange for you is not entirely transactional. If you truly have mastered your craft, when you're playing, when you're creating music, you feel already fulfilled to some degree. You feel you're in your purpose. You feel you've been touched by your inspiration. You feel you're creating something worthwhile. And there's immense satisfaction in that. Even in the sexual context, in the stroker stroke context, after you reach a certain degree of mastery and you're stroking, right? There is a joy in it. There's a joy in just doing it in your own mastery. You're not, you're not doing it just to get kudos from your stroke heat. You're not waiting for that, even though that is also important. But part of it is coming straight up front. You're getting paid up front. When you're in your mastery, you're kind of getting paid up front. You're doing what you're good at, and there is something inherently joyful and purposeful in already doing what you're good at well. Right? All of it should be good. Again, take a dinner party is a very easy common example. If you truly love cooking, you're, you're enjoying yourself two days before when you're planning the menu. 
right? If you really enjoy hosting and cooking. You even enjoy the challenges. Oh, that person can't eat that, that person can't eat that. I know what I'm gonna do, right? You enjoy the whole process. And of course, you like to see the looks on the faces of your friend when they're eating your food saying this is delicious. But you're not waiting for it. Yeah. Right? Ideally, if you actually are waiting entirely for the praise from your friends, they will feel it and they will consider you needy. I mean, so does that answer your question? Yes, and I think for me, I often do not feel mastery in these areas. So that That's a bigger inquiry. Let's serious. let's let's keep that inquiry on the table as we proceed because that is a very important piece. I think I think this is this is I'm um, jumping ahead a little bit. I think what has happened is because we are so prejudiced against the servant position. We have also sabotaged the master position. <laughs> we, we are so much in the egalitarian fever these days that we actually don't grant people their mastery. We think everyone can do anything. And it's really a bad and not functional idea. But, uh, I think we, we are running with that prejudice, especially in our intimate relationships, quite a bit. And it's, uh, it's not the ideal way to relate in my opinion. All right, let's, uh, you know what, read this paragraph again for me. Mastery and service. Somebody, and then we'll do the next one. You can only serve from a position of mastery. You can only give to others what you really, really have. Whatever you're good at is what you have. The thing that you've spent your 10,000 hours on is your mastery. Serve others with your mastery. Be a servant to the world through that which you're master for at. That is the, that is a life of purpose and engagement. How are you doing over there? I'm sorry, we in and out, I apologize. Okay. I'm tired, tired. All right. It's okay. Mastery, service, and purpose. If you have no mastery, acquire some. If people find you useful, they will keep you around. They will bond with you. They will want to exchange with you. They will want to keep you happy. Acquire mastery. Live in your mastery. Serve others with your mastery. This is the short, shortest path to live a life of purpose. The surrender position is the position of gracious receptivity. A musician needs attent attentive and gracious ears. A chef needs hearty appetites and a conscious palate. Great teachers need great students. Surrender. Surrender is the position of receptivity, of getting filled up, of getting nourished, Surrender is the position through which we allow all the good and the beautiful and the delightful to enter our spirit. Live and surrender if you want to feel replete. Replete, thank you. If you want to feel the world as beautiful and benevolent, if you want the world to enrich you and help you along your path, open yourself up and let others master in the world and the, the world win. Like open yourself up and let others master in the world win. One of the most common ways we do this, all of us do it, is when we're like, I really, really need to listen to some music right now. And we put on music that we think is absolutely masterful and we give ourselves over to it. And we feel good. And we feel there is beauty in this world and there's great mastery in this world. Whoever your favorite musician is, somebody you think is an absolute magician. Whether it's Leonard Cohen's lyrics, whether it's John Coltrane's saxophone, whatever does it for you. You turn that on me like all of life is not ugly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That exchange right there is exactly that. That you go to something you feel is so masterful, is so inspired, and you open yourself up because we so desperately need that almost like water to the soul. We need the mastery and the beauty of others. We also get it from nature. We may not think of nature as masterful, but if we think of it in this terms, that is how nature also enriches us. Something I'm hearing that just a new opening for me from my share is um, there was a period in my life from like 01 to 08 that I produced over like 450 events or something. I'm saying. I kind of stopped um, of events and seminars and it's like 
hours. I mean, each event's three days, add that, that's gotta be 10,000 hours somewhere along the way. And I really realized that it was kind of a, like a musician. It's like I lost myself and, yeah. and I, I pulled the plug, you know, back in 9 out of 10. Yeah. And like I miss it. You know, there's a, there's a missing, but I'm not, I wasn't sure why until like this conversation. Yeah. There's a, um, I've seen Kathy Griffin, Griffin, the com comedian, like about five times. And she's truly just like, the, she's a master. You know, she's just this, I love watching her because she's like, yeah. there's this mastery of her and a mic for three hours and no one moves. Yeah. Like, that's just like masterful. And I didn't really get how she, being the mass, she's on the stage, but she's surrendering to us. And I yeah. never really got that until just now. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny. One, one way to appreciate that is to actually get a behind the scenes look at how hard comedians work oh, to, shit, shit. to tighten your set. Mm -hmm. so every pause, every cough, every sneeze. You think it was spontaneous. It, <laughs> right. it was timing, it was beat. Right. I remember years ago, we had this very certain that this thing happened. I and my wife, it was the 4th of July. And for, we have beautiful fireworks in New York City, but it's always really hard to get to them. It's always packed. <laughs> and we're like, do we really want to do fireworks today? We've seen enough fireworks. We've never seen the mood. So we went to uh, Broadway. We had tickets on, you know, they're always at discount tickets. And 4th of July, it was not high demand for place. And we got front row seats to proof oh. with uh, Mary Louise Parker mm. in the lead row. So we like literally front row. Mm -hmm. I felt really underdressed. I was like out there walking the park in like front of my shorts. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember sitting there and we thought the whole time, oh my God, she is such a great sport. She had such a horrible cold and she still gave a great performance. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a horrible cold. Every, every sniffle, everything, every part, it was part of the performance, right? And we realized later, oh my God, every pick of the napkin, every snuffling, every sound, you know how nasally she is mm -hmm. in her voice. And, and it's like, it was all performance. And I bet if you went and saw her the next day or the day after, every sniffle will be right there in the same <laughs> fucking spot. It's mastering. Right? It is mastery. I mean, that it's like the realism is so deep. You could, and comedians are the same way. If you ever seen them prepare, oh my god, the way they stitch their performance together, word after word, is this word better, that word better? If you pause a little bit more here and you look to the audience this way, it's funnier. Why is it funnier when you look to the right and not to the left? I don't know, but the right is funnier. Right, and that is mastery. That is like obsessive mastery because why? It gets the better response out of their audience for whatever reason. And in that case, she's serving the audience. She's absolutely. She's, she's serving to her. I'm being happy right now. Yeah. she's serving to the audience. She is the the, the master. The master is. Let's, let's take it for example. Kathy is my habit. So the master is Kathy, or the master is the. No, the master is the one holding the position and pouring the energy out in the audience. But to be that masterful, you are that nuanced and you are paying that much attention and you're holding your craft that much because this change is a little bit better than that change. Because taking the music, this, this, this particular phrase in this direction is a little better than, and that's masterful. Yeah. The subtlety here for me is the master is the servant, which is master a master is the servant. How else? How else would you define a comedian? It's very easy to see it when it's happening live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most of mastery and surrender is not happening live, but with, with artists you can see it happen live. Who is the comedian up there for? For an empty audience, empty stage, empty? Yeah, of no, of course not. Who is the actor performing for? Who is the musician performing for? Who is the chef cooking for? If it's happening in real time. Right, who is the surgeon there on his or her feet for six, eight, 10, 12, 16 hours? Because they can be, right? And years and years of training, very elite cerebral capacity, very high IQ people with dozen years of training, 
pouring this out on somebody. It's absolute mastery and they're there to serve with their mastery. And the more exclusive, the more uh, in-depth that mastery is, the more we pay them for it. Are you going to bargain with your brain surgeon or your cardiologist on how much to pay them? No. Right? So I think, yeah. All right. It's, uh, any, any other questions on the last part? Any other questions? Read it one more time. Who are read it? Because I, I want you to really get this part. I want you to get the two position of what mastery and surrender is. Surrender also is a word that has really, you know, it's not really accepted today, but I find these two words really encapsulate these traditions. You just have to get a little bit used to them. Okay. okay. If you have no mastery, acquire some. If people find you useful, they'll keep you around. They so this may sound like a facetious thing to say, but I really am deadly serious about it. I mean that mean this in relationships. I don't really believe in unconditional love. I believe we are all self-centered and I believe we make our bonds because the person we are bonding with improves our life immensely. Mm -hmm. They are of use to us and their use to us does not simply have to be at the first chakra level. We're not using them just for survival and money, even though that bond is also important because life can be hard and you need to pull your resources. But at every center, whether it's a sexual center, a steam center, a heart center, somebody is serving you in some way, somebody is making your your life is better with them than without them. You're not there unmotivated. And when your life is no longer better with them than without them, people part ways. And in a way they should. Right? So if you don't have mastery, if there's nothing about you to which you can serve your partner, your relationship is rather on fragile ground. You should really find out. You should be able to define what your lover does for you. If you have, if you can't make a list of how your life is better with this person and without that person, your relationship might be tough. Because I tell you, by the end of relationship, people can't name a single fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a dead giveaway. So, so, so just on that point, so when you said people can't remember at the end, my sense is that there could be some truth in that, but there's also the sense of there's so much emotion running that you're not looking for the things that enriches your life. That's also very much possible. I think both things can happen. People right. can stop being, people can stop really relishing their surrender position. You can become a malcontent. Mm -hmm. You can become so fucking ungracious that you don't see the two right. things your partner is going for you. Yes, very much so. And then you go to a therapist and your therapist makes you make a list and you're like, well, these are all the things my partner does for me, but I don't really feel any of them. You know, when will you feel them? Three months after you break up. You're like, damn, there was a lot happening with that person that nobody's around here to do anymore. <laughs> So yes, very much so. So I'm not saying this is like necessarily objective reality. You, you know, you can go to, the, I mean, this happens quite a lot, actually, in New York City. You can go to a concert where amazing people are performing on stage and assholes in front of you are on their phone. Yes. Oh my God, yeah. Right? And I'm like, why are you here? <laughs> why are you here? Yeah, that's right? right, you're like, this is really so insulting and ungracious. Like there's something really beautiful in front of you. You didn't even have to come here. Why have you shown up all day here paying money to be here? And then you're answering texts in front of me. Right? And yes, we are assholes. When we do that, we are being complete assholes. If you don't appreciate the mastery that is available for you to surrender to. And why don't we do it? Because the ego doesn't want to surrender. You can answer your parents when your undivided attention is being asked for for somebody's mastery. You think you're just too cool for school. I don't sit still for anybody, right? You would be a lousy person to be in a relationship with. You would be a lousy person to give to because you know, yeah. no graciousness. That can be a relationship killer too. No matter what I bring to him or her, I don't get appreciated. I think the words I'm like hung up on in this particular paragraph is 
acquire some. <laughs> yeah. Acquire some. Acquire if you don't have mastery. Oh, if you have no mastery, acquire some. I'm like, what should I acquire? <laughs> well, in this course, we are teaching people how to acquire more awareness and mastery in your touch. We are teaching them how to be better lovers. We are teaching them how to handle their lovers better. So there's like real training available. I don't care if I'm a big, I mean, you know, I think you're also a big believer in education if you were with Landmark for 15 years. You obviously believe in improvement. Yeah. <laughs> So, thank you. Okay. Make it going. Yeah, just read it one more time. Yeah, sure. Um, they will bond with you. They will want to exchange with you. They will want to keep you happy. Acquire mastery. Live in your mastery. Serve others with your mastery. This is the shortest path to living a life of purpose. So this is a, this is an argument I've heard from other people these days, and I want to kind of repeat it. The I think. Joseph Campbell really fucked us all on this when he said, follow your bliss. <laughs> Better advice would be don't follow your bliss, follow what you're really good at. Mm -hmm. yeah. And hopefully get good at something that you enjoy. Yeah. But make it, be, let it be once you would, because doing what you are good at will not tickle all the time. Mm -hmm. Living in your mastery is not pleasurable all the time. But I mean, it's not, it's yeah. not like a joy ride. No matter what your work is, no, no matter what you're good at, it's hard work, whatever you're good at. So if you think, you know, being in your life purpose is just levitating the whole time and being blissful, I think it's nonsense. <laughs> so pursuing, I think pursuing happiness itself is just really a bad idea. Don't pursue happiness. Pursue mastery and live in your mastery and happiness will come by this high bonus. So I would offer a slight tweak to that, right. which is, just use the synonym of service instead of mastery. So live in your service. No, live in your mastery. Don't, don't shy away from it. But I'm, I guess for me, I'm learning that mastery and service are synonymous. And it yes, like but if you don't have mastery, you can't give service. Right. If you don't have mastery, but you want to be a servant, you're going to be half a servant. What can I use you for? Mm -hmm. Right. What I can, can I use you for? Serve food, but I suck at cooking. Well, I can serve food, but I suck at cooking. You don't want me to. Right, do. exactly. So really? it'd be better. Yeah, if you were playing a game, it would be like, okay, everybody write down the three things you are really good at. Tell me what you're good at, and then we will give you tasks according to that. And if we do that well, everybody is bringing their A game because they're doing something they're good at, and we get to enjoy it. That's so get good, good at game. something and then offer it. To Absolutely. So maybe, okay. that, maybe that is actually the key to finding the happiness is to be First, get good at something. Be useful. And be in service and do that. Yeah. That's where and you know, jumping ahead in the conversation, yeah. that is also a genuine path to esteem. Yeah. <laughs> being masterful <laughs> and being needed and being useful to other people is a genuine path to esteem, mm -hmm. not a made up path to self esteem, not this is my image and I feel so great about myself and my affirmations. Right? <laughs> if you're really good at something and you're serving your family, your lovers, your community with it, and they value for it, you will feel more at home, more a sense of belonging, like your life is not useless, right? Doesn't mean that can't create, how many, I've, you know, I've never watched that, uh, was it ER, the doctor show? I watched all these snippets of it. I remember one great scene of it where, you know, the John, is it Jonathan Edwards, what's his name? There's something Edwards. There's a scene where, you know, obviously all of their personal lives are complete shit. So he knows this woman is leaving him. And he's just come out, out of the hospital after like an 18-hour shift, right? And he's in the parking lot looking at his car, thinking of going home. And instead, the, another ambulance is coming with patients. And he just turns around and goes back to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Okay. So... It's understandable, why? Because he's really needed back there. He can actually save lives. But if he goes home, all that's left is the debris of a fucked up relationship that he destroyed. Complete failure there and being needed and being in your mastery. Imbalance, but you can see the logic. You can see where the satisfaction is. That's not a good way to live, right? Balanced way to live would be to actually have mastery in a couple of different areas of your life. 
but you can see where the where the psyche would go like why oh going home one more fight cannot yeah. I want to do it right and we do this sometimes this is when people become workaholics nice. they're you know and they're doing it their addiction is not inherently an evil one like a doctor going back into the emergency room to serve dying and keep patients in crisis and trauma is not evil he's helping people but his own life is in shambles because everything else is falling apart, except from this one area of mastery. He doesn't seem to have mastery anywhere else. He doesn't have any friends. His wife is leaving him. He's alone. He's lonely. Imbalance. So, anyway. Live in your mastery. Serve others with your mastery. This is the shortest path to living a life of purpose. Cool. The surrender position is the position of gracious receptivity. I did that one. But, okay. A musician needs attention, sorry, attentive and gracious ears. A chef needs hearty appetites and a conscious palate. Great teachers need great students. Surrender is the position of receptivity, of getting filled up, of getting nourished. Surrender is the position through which we allow all the good and the beautiful and the delightful to enter our spirit. Surrender, sorry, live and surrender if you want to feel like sleep, or sleep, sleep, or sleep. What is that? Do? Can someone help me? Fill to the brim. Thank like you. Filled all the way up. I filled up. Fill, fill your cup. Okay. Live and surrender if you want to feel, fill up, pull up. <laughs> if you want to feel the world is beautiful and benevolent. If you want the world to enrich you, and help you along your path. Open yourself up and let others mastery and the world in. You know, I, there's a joke that goes with this, which I didn't say it first, I heard it, but I repeat it often, which is, when some, somebody wants to top you, bottom immediately. <laughs> what, what? <laughs> when somebody wants to top you, bottom immediately. Mm. And that may, again, sound like a cheeky thing to say, but the logic of it is this. If somebody is actually ready to pour their mastery into you, become gracious immediately and receive. Yes. Become receptive. There's something tremendously beautiful and wise in that. Right? People hear that as if somebody wants to be an asshole and dominate you, you should just roll over. That's not, that's not where it's anchored. But so, if you see somebody coming at you from their position of mastery wanting to offer something to you, immediately become receptive. That is a very conscious and beautiful way to live. Right? When, if you want to be more sexual about it, you can say it, say, it, say it this way. When somebody really wants to penetrate you, let them penetrate you. So when you were, the first example of that that I thought of was a mentor-mentee relationship you know, they, they're maybe dominating you in a business situation. It's just like, okay, fill me up with your knowledge. Fill me up with what you can impart to me so I can learn by what you're doing and, and observe you. Well, we, holding the dominance position doesn't necessarily mean dominating. No, no, no. Yeah. But it was just more like the, as you were speaking, the mentor-mentee yeah. image kind of came to mind. Right. Um, and uh, there are, to your second point, there are more ways to dominate there are more ways to penetrate than just physically. Yeah. So. And again, these are chargy words, so I don't, that's why I don't want to use them first, but sometimes we use that language in the DS context and people don't understand what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. Yeah. If somebody who's skilled at something wants to pull that skill and mastery into you, it is an offer, it is a position of privilege. This is also why we say submission is a position of privilege which people don't get. People think submission is a weak position. Mm -hmm. This is the logic why submission is a position of privilege. If somebody who is skilled at dominating you, somebody who is skilled at giving you a journey, wants to give you a journey, they are voluntarily asking that they pour their energy and mastery into you. Mm -hmm. It's like they are offering you a well-cooked meal. Mm -hmm. It's like a good chef is offering you so sit down, let me feed you. Mm -hmm. Or a very talented musician is offering to play for you. 
That's a good offer. Be gracious and receive it. Right? I mean, think of whatever. Think of a musician you admire. Imagine you went to some event and you're like, come sit here after I sing you a song. You'd be like, <laughs> right? And that would be the right response. That's a big offer. Offer like that doesn't come along any day. Anyway, so keep that in mind. Your receptivity is very much a necessary ingredient for this transaction to occur. Build relationships along master surrender lines. If you want to connect with anyone, find them in their mastery and surrender to them in their mastery. Find people whose mastery you can and want to surrender into. Those are the correct relationship matches. And look for others who graciously want to surrender into your mastery. That's the quickest path to genuine bonding that is not anchored in past traumas and patterns and habits. When you find yourself leaving someone whose mastery nourishes you to be with others who have no mastery that serves you, know that you are acting from pain and pattern. Find teachers whom you consider great teachers and then become their great student. Find a dom who you consider a masterful dom and then become a masterful sub to your masterful dom. The deeper your surrender, the more you will be amused to your master's mastery. Great students make their teachers greater. Great subs make their doms more brilliant. Questions, thoughts, comments? This part about, you know, when people you know, I think one of the biggest uh, glitches I see in people's psyche is they, they, when I actively scan what they're doing with all their relationships, they seem to be pouring more of their energy into relationships that are not serving them. Mm -hmm. It's a very odd phenomenon, but I've like noticed it consistently in myself and others. There's really a glitch in our system. The noisiest relationships usually draw the most from us and the noisiest relationships usually aren't giving us back that much and oftentimes there are these other people in our lives who are really generous who are always there for us who give us a lot and we kind of almost keep them on the back burner like oh i don't need to worry about you which i think is a really stupid way to live it is really a bad way to invest our time and our relationship energy so how do you get into the inquiry of finding the people whose mastery you can and want to surrender into? They would be people who enrich your life in whatever way you want your life enriched. In our context, if you're looking for greater sensuality in your life, if you're exploring domination and submission, you need a partner that can help you realize your archetype that can be a partner with you there. So look for someone who has the mastery that you can use, that is satisfying to you, that is enriching to you. Yeah. How are you doing over there? You okay? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts and questions on this? Yeah. I had a thought. Um, I think you already kind of addressed it. What if you are in your mastery and you're still like there's a persistent use uselessness just like whether it's a story or just just like there that's how i feel a lot uselessness explain what you mean by that like if i am serving others or or giving what i what i'm good at giving to other yeah. people and i still feel like it's not it's not valued in the world yeah it's not valued. she it's doesn't not. feel what she is her master is valued in the world do you feel that way too I do. Not the same mastery, yeah. but I, I think it's like it's the same thing that you said a moment ago, flipped. Where um, if you if you're wanting like I don't you want to hold on, but you also want partners who no, will be gracious. Me, I know that the conversation is going in all directions. Let me just. Uh, I would say we do tend to sell ourselves short in our areas of mastery. 
I think we are living in a culture where being proud of what you're good at almost seems to be like a little taboo. And I think it's, it's really not a great uh, philosophy to hold. Acquire mastery and then be proud of it and actually just advertise it. Say to people, I'm good at this. Mm -hmm. I'm a good sugar, I'm a good dom, I'm a good cook. I'm a good teacher. I'm pretty good at playing the guitar, whatever it is. I think this false modesty actually sabotages us and it doesn't serve either. It doesn't serve either party, your end or the other person's end. Right? If you are going to be serving somebody, do you want your chef to like put down the plate and say, I'm really a terrible cook, I hope you like it on my diet? <laughs> It's not really a great uh, starting point, is it? And you girls want that from a lover? Oh God, I hope you don't, I don't hate me. I, I'm not really good at this. And like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> you don't, you really don't. Right, go acquire some skill. And you don't have to boast about your skill. You don't have to exaggerate it. But to the degree that you have skill and mastery, just own it and speak it and be honest about it. And you can be, right? I often train men, they're like, well, you know, I really want to learn uh, role play, I want to learn BDSM, and, well, I feel like I really, really need to become really, really good at it before anybody would uh, play with me. I'm like, actually, that's not true. I'll prove it to you. You, you put, put your online ad and say, I am a novice Tom. I've taken one class in rope. I'm looking for a rope partner to practice on. My date will simply involve rope and nothing else. You can even keep your clothes on and see if you get any offers. You think he would or not? Yes. He would. He would, mm -hmm. right? This is who I am, I'm starting out. I would love, want to get better, and uh, I'm not masterful at it, but I enjoy it. And this is my offer. And there'll be plenty of people like, I can see yes to that. You don't need to be superlative of everything. You can, you can invite your friends. I'm taking a class in French cooking, Still getting the hang of it. Can't promise how the dishes are going to come out. But you're welcome to come out. Come have dinner on Saturday. I'm preparing these two dishes that have been assigned to me. I think there are friends who would say yes to that. They would get a kick out of it. Even if the meal went badly, you'd probably have a fun time. Probably get drunk. <laughs> Order pizza. <laughs> but if you are, but that part, clarity, is actually attractive. That clarity, you can play with. But the self flagellating like, oh, I'm not really young. That's like, oh, that's no fun. That'd be my advice on that. That doesn't mean, in, you know, doesn't, if, it might be two separate things that are happening. If you're no longer enjoying your area of mastery, if it's actually no longer fulfilling you, I think that's a different problem. That may be a, soul, a call for the soul that you need, you need a different area of mastery. And that happens a lot to people these days. People change careers, people change directions in life. Right? I think the, the piece that comes up for me is I enjoyed something back then and I stopped it. Uh, if I had to look, probably because someone told me it was not valuable in the, this, in the world. Yeah. Um, so looking at it again, really, like I really actually... You know, one of the, what do they say that, uh, like a, a musician, when they, they're playing, they don't know what time it is. Kind of one of those, like when they play, yeah. they're like, they can go for hours. I'm like, oh, no clue at the time. There's like time races. Yeah. That's how I was in that space, right? So I could do it for days and it just was like, yeah. didn't even phase me, right? So it's just looking at it from a different perspective. Right. Well, I would say anything that, that gave you that level of engagement and flow, yeah. and almost being in touch with inspiration, totally. time gets lost. I would say that is, I would say don't give up on that entirely. Yeah, making that into a commercial venture is always a challenge. Right. And it's not, not a challenge for anybody. Right? Even the musicians who are millionaires today played in every dive bar in the country at some point. They really did. If you don't believe me, you should read uh, the history of you too. It's really humbling. Mm. You think they just started at stadiums? They really didn't. <laughs> no, nor were they good at the beginning, which is also amusing. <laughs> like they were actually not very good musicians like by their own telling and by the telling of the people who were guiding them. So it's like, but if you have found a place that gives you that flow, I think it's uh, you should honor that to some degree. And if you can monetize it, that would be a happy life. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Yes. Okay, so on this topic of like, oh, tell someone if you have mastery or like give them mastery in. And like, for me, I, I, I tend to feel like within the wrong relationship, getting sex, I don't actually have mastery yeah. in really anything. But, but then comparatively, I know that for myself, how much I've improved feels like mastery for me. But when I'm giving like best attention that I've cultivated, I don't feel like because I'm either around lots of other people who have that skill, or I, I guess I feel like what is mastery for me is still like kind of like a fledgling beginner for other people that I'm interacting with, and so they don't really appreciate how much I'm I am trying to give, right. and so I like I guess I just need to keep improving in 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 the sort of listening and all of the type of giving more mastery servant. Yeah, that would be my encouragement. You can almost be a little competitive about it. <laughs> you can. Like, I want to be more useful. I want to be the go-to person in this department. Men are that, right? I coach men, like, why are you here? Like, I want to please my women. I want to get them off. I want to get them off. Like, are you not getting them off at all? No, I'm pretty good. I want to get better. I want to be the best sex she has ever had. It's a good goal to keep. <laughs> Right? I'm not sure whether you're going to reach that goal there, but it's like a good and like, no, I really want to get better at it. If I've made improvement from last year to this year, obviously there's more to do, and I want to keep growing in my mastery. I think that's amazing. I'm not sure if that's not like a genuine desire for me. It's coming from something else. I'm not sure, but it's, it's not quite like the example you're saying. So, what is it? Um, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I know, like, I spent the last few years, like, Learning to own, and it was more about becoming mastery in receiving, yeah. I guess. So I'm like, that's what I have to offer. Like, gives me an hour. So like, amazing. We're, we're, we're getting to that part, actually. Say again? We're getting to that part because you became really good at the surrender position, which is beautiful and lovely, but it is not the mastery position. Okay. And I think actually, women in your uh, group and culture kind of have been gypped from their mastery. That's my opinion. You're told receive, 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 and that's complete. And I think that's, I think you got shortchanged, all of you girls. That's my opinion. But let's keep going, it comes up. Next. Yep. Read the Master Surrender Path to Self Esteem. Oh, I'm reading. Yeah, sorry, I'm reading. I'm totally. That's what I just said. Mastery is the true path to esteem. Surrender is the path for reducing the egoic self. Together, they form a powerful one-two combination for acquiring genuine self-esteem. Practice both. Surrender will reduce the self. Mastery will increase the esteem. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. no. no. Surrender will reduce the self. So, I mean, so I yeah. literally look at this idea that it's a third, part of the third chakra circuit is self-esteem. Mm -hmm. To me, these are actually two different qualities and two different problems. I've never heard it this way. So. You are not. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> wants to acquire self-esteem, and I think self-esteem is one quantity. To me, it really isn't one quantity. The bigger yourself, the smaller your esteem is going to be. It's kind of a Zen take on things. The bigger your ego, yeah. the more in your mind you are, the more self-obsessed you are, the smaller your esteem is going to be. Mm. The bigger your posture it might be in the world, I'm so cool, I'm so hot, right? But it won't be genuine esteem. The smaller yourself, the smaller your concept of self actually, the easier the inquiry, the less the obsession with self-esteem, simply because you're not going to think about yourself that much. What are you thinking about? Other things? Life? You know, thinking too many other things. You're not self-obsessed, you're not obsessed with your image, you're not obsessed with what everybody's thinking about you, you're not obsessed with what Eckhart would say, the little me. Mm -hmm. The story of me, the little me, the image of me, looking good, avoiding looking bad. Mm -hmm. That's the self and the self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Right? And our any path that goes into surrender is powerful at reducing that ego itself. Any path of surrender, 
whether it's the path to eros, whether it's the path to devotion, whether it's the path to presence, whether you do it in primal screen therapy or you do it in ayahuasca ceremony, when you're going deeply into surrender, it kind of reduces that heaviness of the me, the I, the me we are carrying around all over the place. It comes out a little bit lighter. And if the self is a little lighter, the problem of self-esteem is a little bit lighter. You forget yourself. You don't care anymore. You're in your joy. You're in your flow. When you are in your flow and you say you can't even remember the time is passing, there is no self. You're actually not worried about your self-esteem when you're in flow. Why? Because there is no me in the moment. All of your energies are engaged someplace in a task, which would be your mastery. And the more you're in your mastery, in a way, the more legitimate esteem you have, because you're actually doing something, creating something, acquiring mastery and serving others with it. Does that make sense? Questions? Moments, thoughts? That's good. All right, keep reading. Your mastery makes you eligible and sought after. If you know how to surrender, master being great masters around you will want to pour their mastery into you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Living in your mastery will make for a life of purpose. Being able to surrender will enrich and invigorate your life and give you a sense of belonging in a benevolent universe. So this is a very, this may not seem like a very obvious point, right? But you will feel you're living in a benevolent universe. Believe it or not, when you are grooving to your favorite music, in that moment, from this perspective, you actually believe the world is a friendly place. When you're truly in an experience of surrender, when you're, when you're beholding beauty, like, you know, you're standing in front of the Grand Canyon or a sunset or something, and you're like, just letting yourself be struck by it, in that moment, you feel the world is a better place than you may have done an hour ago when you were fighting with somebody. Our, our peak experiences of awe, our peak experiences of beauty and beatitude, they happen, they are pretty much the same as the state of surrender. And the state of surrender makes it, it, it what it does is it dissolves our separation consciousness. Mm -hmm. And when it dissolves your consciousness, you're not standing as a little me in front of the Grand Canyon. You are just this perceiving being sitting there with your mouth open. Looking at it. And there's like no I in between because it's really not needed. And in that dissolution of separateness, you feel maybe the world is really not out to kill you every second of the day. That maybe I actually belong here. That maybe I actually am part of this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, no? Yes. Yeah, our peak experiences of beauty, and whether they come in an artistic framework or whether they come in a religious speak, they all have the same quality of the, the separation consciousness. It, it thins out a little bit. And when it thins out, we have a better sense of belonging in this world. Hmm. So the esteem comes from part you're, you keep referring to. I'm saying that, that is where the self disappears. And if the self disappears, the question of self-esteem disappears. If you truly are standing in front of a Grand Canyon and really letting it in, uh -huh. In that moment, I doubt you will be obsessed with your self-esteem. Right. It really is a non sequitur. It doesn't really show up. And so if you're not present to your self-esteem, you're in full surrender mastery. You're not present to self. Like, like fleecing apart that is yeah. in self. Is that fair? If, you're now, not if I'm, if I'm that standing way. here in complete surrender, let's just use the Grand Canyon. Like, you know, it's a common example, and most people have a big experience. You know, Grand Canyon really doesn't disappoint. Hmm. And there's nothing much to do there, really. All you can do is stand there and look. Yeah. There's not much to do there. Let's say I'm there, and I am just taking it in. And I'm like, and like, I have no sense of self in the moment. And all of a sudden, I see there's a pretty girl standing next to me. 
now I might strike the pose of a poet taking in the beauty of the Grand Canyon. Because someone's watching. It's no longer that complete emptiness simply sitting there with my mouth open right. in front of this like. Now it's like, oh. The self has come back and hmm. attention is split between here and there. The beauty experience, the aesthetic experience has been lost. Now I'm back in image maintenance because I am trying to make an impression on another human being. I want them to think a certain way about me. And that is the obsession of the third chakra circus. That is the obsession of the little me. Mm -hmm. Looking good, not looking bad. Somebody is here to whom I can look good. And the self shows up again, right? You're alone in the elevator. You're just wandering, door opens, somebody walks in. The self comes right back in because another is there and the game of making an impression on them, having them think well of you, at least having them think you're not a complete weirdo, mm. all of it jumps right in, mm. right? Experiences of surrender, they reduce our little me self and our mastery genuinely increases our esteem. So this idea of self-esteem to me very much ties in with the master and surrender balance, the master and surrender play. And both of them, if you do them well, help with esteem in their own separate ways. Good. Living in mastery will connect you with inspiration. Surrendering well to someone's mastery will make you the beneficiary, beneficiary of their inspiration. When you are truly in your mastery, you will be functioning minus your ego. When you are truly in your surrender, you will be functioning minus your ego. Learn to masterfully occupy both positions. This will lead to a fifth chakra activation, which is a pretty high activation on the journey scale. So this is an interesting point that I've observed, that when you're in your mastery, there's no ego. When you're in your surrender, there's no ego. Again, if you, if you watch some, again, it's easier to watch as an artist because we can watch them in their mastery live. You can't really observe engineers and coders and unless you're a surgeon in their mastery body. But when you watch somebody really masterful in their groove, mm -hmm. you can kind of tell they're not even there. Right? And when you watch someone deep in surrender, you just feel they're in the receiving, whether it's sex, whether they're in deep subspace, whether they're really enjoying a meal, whether whatever it is that in both cases, the ego diminishes. And that is what makes ecstasy possible in both positions. In mastery position, your ego gets out of the way and inspiration is allowed to come in. And surrender position, you know, our energy rises very high and it touches areas that we refer to with words like bliss and ecstasy. Good? Yeah. Read the next one. This is for you. <laughs> women in sexual mastery one of the biggest gap in women's sexual spiritual evolution right now is that they are relying too much on the path of surrender and not enough on the path of mastery learning to receive sensation and letting it move your system is important when it is half a journey also focus on acquiring sexual mastery learn to move the system of others towards sexual surrender Without this crucial piece, your sexual or spiritual endeavor will remain confused and incomplete. Receiving ad nauseum will not bring you home. It will create frustration and entitlement and bafflement. Mm -hmm. Each position contains its own channels to higher inspiration and wisdom. Use every bit of your femininity and beauty and sexual prowess and skill to move the system of other men and women towards their sexual surrender. This will bring you in touch with the archetype of the sexual priestess. Ooh, what's that? Hmm. Just for a second. Any questions on that? No, um, I just, I just, I just, lots of things. <laughs> and it's like, I one feels kind of like a mind box to me, mm -hmm. and number two, it makes sense. And I knew that on a certain level, but from the specific training that I've had. Yeah. And 
um, on one hand, I, could, I felt someone really hot after you talked to me before, like, oh my god, I'm doing it wrong. And um, on the other hand, I know that I, I gained in that that I didn't have before when I've yeah. been like, I'm fine. No, I don't need that probably a little more before. Yeah. So I still think it was really valuable, but I can tell that something's missing. And, and I've been fearful, especially when my ex-boyfriend's at was from one case, he called me like masculine and said all these mean things to me, like these are all typical masculine things and I'm trying to rebalance out and then to be called that feels really harsh. And so I, I'm like, oh, I want to be feminine. And then am I being masculine if I'm, if I'm giving, if I'm, if I'm in mastery, if I'm in service? Mm -hmm. And so although when I was a teenager, I was like totally fine with all that, it kind of shifted. So I'm like, okay, I feel like a little bit of permission to learn like, go into that and not be called masculine. I think being masterful, I think to say being masterful and masculine is like insulting to both. Yeah. <laughs> we are all masterful in yes. many things. We are, we all need these, that's why, I, that's why I separated master and surrender position from the down sub dynamic because down sub are very, are typical. They are kind of personal and they don't necessarily shift within most people. But master and surrender are positions we are all playing. These are positional archetypes, if that makes sense. We are all playing the master position much of the time in our life and we all want to be in the surrender position because we do want to be nurtured and nourished and we want to be the recipients of the richness other people are bringing into this world. And we are doing it all the time anyway, whether we are verbally appreciating that or acknowledging that in the moment or not, right? If you like your car and you drive and sit in your car and say, I fucking love this car, you in fact are giving acknowledgement to the mastery of the engineers who made that car because it didn't fall out of the sky. Right? If you if you say, Wow, I love this jacket, I love this, you are paying a master for designers. What you're enjoying didn't come out of nowhere. It may not be a very personal thing, because the person who made it is not right there with you. That's why I'm saying it's easier to see it with art. So you can kind of meet, have a meeting point, live, between stage and audience. And there you can almost have a transmission. This is also why actors get so high with stage work, that they don't get from movie work. Mm -hmm. Even when you ask actors, well, what do you do? They will say, well, I actually perform for the crew. I've heard many, many actors say this. I perform for the crew. It seems like a very bizarre thing for an A-list actor to say. You're performing for the crew. Like, yeah, I need an audience. Mm -hmm. And I can tell, and they are so jaded, they've seen every, every line, 20 takes. So if I know they moved even a little bit from my last take, I got them. And they're looking for it. Mm -hmm. What is the gaffer doing? Was he still watching? Or is he checking his iPhone? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But there's, there's this thing, did you move somebody in real time? Did somebody, get something from what you are offering in real time, and that actually is an indication that surrender and mastery is taking place, right? If I say something here valuable that goes in, that exchange took place, you know what I mean? The archetype of sexual priestess, I'm unfamiliar, we discussed. Well, you know, I'm not familiar with it either. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bring it up because it's being thrown around a lot these days in our enlightened sexual circles and I think people are talking out of their ass most of the time. Because <laughs> everybody's enlightened, everybody's a sexual priestess, everybody's a sacred over these days. And, I'm like, and I, the, the idea of archetypes are very dear to me. To me they are very, very real. To me they almost like uh, exist in the realm of ideas like Plato will talk about or something. I actually believe these are templates upon which our entire personalities and our Humanity is constructed. Yeah. Archetypes are very real. So the archetype of a sexual priestess is a, is a very beautiful idea. It's a very beautiful concept. And I would like to believe, I don't know for sure, I'm not a historian. I would like to believe it has existed in certain cultures. I don't really see it very prevalent in our culture, even though it's being bandied about quite a bit because yeah. we are into doing that kind of shit. What do you mean here? Because I've never been... Exactly that. That a woman who is in her sexual mastery as well as surrender. Not just surrender and not just mastery. 
someone who is able to do both and do both of them masterfully. Again, sorry for the overlapping of words. If you can do the master position masterfully, and if you can do the surrender position masterfully, and you can do it in the okay. sexual realm, okay. you okay. then you deserve the title of that archetype. I will, I, and I can bring this home to you in this way. This is another archetype, kind of like a cop and politician that today we have, our, we, we, it stinks to us. But try and imagine the good priest. I know it's hard these days, but try and imagine the genuinely good priest. Yeah. You know what the good priest will have? He'll have two characteristics. One of them would be he would truly serve his congregation. But the other one would be he is truly surrendered to God. Yeah. And that is his mastery and that is his surrender. His surrender comes first. Yeah. It's through his surrender that inspiration comes to him that he knows what to do, and then he pushes it out and serves his congregation. And in the serving, he is masterful in that. He probably is a great orator. He knows, he knows his people. He knows to say just the right things at the right time. He has the skill to soothe and balance and to strengthen his congregation. And at the same time, it is not coming from him. He is holding a bigger calling. Yes, I always describe this I actually use this in my BDSM class. We describe this as the big L. Big L. 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 That you are open to something higher and in that is your surrender. And that's the same surrender you would see in great artists. Again, jazz musicians are my favorite one to witness this. You can see it in real time. Like, I know they've been playing for 30 years and I know they're still at their instrument, but what they're doing right now, it feels touched by God. It feels it's a, that is at least a sliver of grace coming through it. It's not entirely them, right? And then they have the mastery, their own skill through which they can channel it, construct it, and pour it out in real time. So these two elements of surrender and mastery, they really, they, in a way, they complete us and they connect us with something higher. If you have the two together. And in our peak moments, whether it's in sensuality, whether it's in stroking, whether it's in doming, you get that connection. You feel that. Yeah. You feel that. You're plugged in to something a little bit bigger than you. And if you're plugged into something bigger than you, that is almost like an electric current that zaps the little me. The little me keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. There's no need for it. Right? And this particular phenomenon, many mystical traditions will talk about. They will talk about becoming hollow. Mm. Sufis will often talk about becoming hollow. Mm. Could you talk about, so since we're on archetypes, how would you define the dom and the sub archetype? Because like, I learned a lot from your definition of master and surrender. Yeah. Dom and sub archetypes to me, they're much more personal and relational and sexual. You can say they are clo more closely tied to a person's personality. Right. And it's tied to where their erotic get off is, where their erotic expression is. Mm -hmm. And for most people, that doesn't change from day to day. Right. So it's good to kind of make and what are this. some of the characteristics of each point? Okay. Characteristics of a dom and characteristic of a sub. So I would say. For the most part, they actually are tied very close to the master and surrender archetypes. This is what I mean by that. Doms usually love holding the master position in their sexual dynamics. They love holding space for somebody. They love having skill. They love creating a journey for someone. They are response freaks and response addicts. <laughs> Just like the chef will probably look through the window and he's looking for the expressions on the faces when they take the first bite. Mm -hmm. Got him, got him, got him, good. Good evening, we're doing good. And they can tell. Mm -hmm. if, if the restaurant is that caliber, not every restaurant is that caliber, but the restaurant you go once or twice a year for a celebration meal, mm -hmm. those bastards have their attention on you like you would not believe. It's not accidental. Mm -hmm. The food there is that good, that consistently. 
right? And they want to make sure they got here, right? If your dessert place goes back half eaten, they notice. Know what I mean? Doms love creating responses from their submissives, and that is a master position obsession. I want my mastery to have impact out there. I'm gonna get you. Comedians say this, because again, their response time is in such, they'll say, I killed it tonight. All right, it's a very aggressive way to do it, mm -hmm. but they know it. They got me. Every beat I wanted to nail in there, they got it. Every setup was perfect, every delivery was perfect. Every note I want to hit, I got it. I killed it. Right? Mm -hmm. Response freaks, master position. And doms love having that with their lover. They love generating responses. And subs love being taken on rides. Subs love being pleasantly surprised. Subs love to receive that attention from someone masterful, from someone who knows how to handle their system. So, one more question. Yeah. So it, sound, so, maybe, so it sounds like the dom and the sub should be able to switch because from what we read earlier, you should be able to switch from master and surrender. So master to surrender, yes. yes. Master to surrender, yes. Dom to sub, not necessarily. This is the, and, okay. this is the point of confusion. And you don't need to switch your archetype from dom to sub or sub to dom in order to switch from mastery to surrender, surrender to mastery. Mm -hmm. So what would a dom who surrenders look like? Receiving service. Yeah. From his partner? Or? From the submissive. Hmm. Right? We call them service scenes. I handle my submissive today. I take her on a great journey. Mm -hmm. She comes back and does a service scene. Whatever way What's a service? that she is pouring attention, energy, and mastery into me to make my life more pleasurable and enjoyable, which can look one of hundred different ways. Rubbing your feet. Right? It's so in a way, he's the dom's receiving. The dom's receiving. The dom is in the surrendered position. He's not no longer putting out energy. But that doesn't necessarily mean he's submissive. He's not necessarily. He could be, but that would be a different shift. He doesn't have to be. And I am how do you distinguish between that shift? That you really, really are switching your archetype. You really want to be sexually handled and taken on the ride by somebody. Mm. Then you're switching between your dom archetype and your sub archetype. And there are people who are like that. They are switches. But I think they are kind of a narrow band in the middle. Most people tend to gravitate towards one end or the other. But to me, this, to, if you're switching archetypes between Dom and Sub, you pretty much are a shapeshifter. You literally have kind of switched your polarities. And most people don't do that. Most people prefer to stay. Their natural joy is in one polarity or the other. Not 100%, but let's say at least 85 to 90%. Nothing is completely set in stone. But the master master surrender position, we are switching all the time. We are switching all the time. That's a very nimble rotating position, right? Right now, I am kind of in the master position trying to hold and serve you people and give you something. Let's say later on, I'm having dinner and Evangeline, she loves to host and take care of things. She's like, sit down, I'll get you food. What do you want to drink? She's in the master position. But I'm not. But she is taking charge. Yeah. She's pouring out energy. She's got her attention on me. Attention is always a good dead giveaway. Mm -hmm. Who is pouring out attention on whom? Master pours attention on the surrender. Always. Okay. If you are ever confused, okay. it's mostly true. Our, yeah. As I say, energy, attention, mastery. If you keep those three together, you will know who's. More than is. Huh? What was the three? Energy, yeah. attention, mastery. Sometimes attention alone can be confusing. You're like, well, all the audience is watching the musicians. The attention is going from the audience to the, to the people on stage. Yes, but not quite. Because everything that they're doing on stage, they're doing it to hold these people's attention. You know what I mean? Well, the space, right. the holding space. They're holding space. Right. They're creating the space. Right. They're creating the attention space. If there were no musicians and performers on stage, 
the attention span in the field is all scattered. Once they come, the attention focuses because they are there with their mastery. So I'm going to go back to your example of dinner. So if Evangeline is serving you dinner. Yeah. Isn't she holding the space and giving you the ride and the experience? She is. But that's not flipping the archetype. It is not flipping the Dom sub archetype. It is flipping the master surrender archetype. I have not become a sexual submissive just because she's serving me dinner. Right. 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 Makes sense. Okay. What I mean? Because, because eating dinner and being served dinner is not belong in the Dom sub category. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. The Dom sub category is a smaller category. That's why when people try to interpret it in every way, like I'm a Dom at work. I'm a dom in my family. Like, it's confusing. You're not a dom at work. There's no sexual dynamic. Your employees are not your submissives. You don't have contracts with them. You don't feel them whenever you want to. It doesn't work that way. You're not in a dom sub dynamic with your employer employees. It's just only with your children. That's why you're in a master surrender dynamic. And if you keep that clearer, you will realize that if you remember that the master is there to serve the surrender position, you will realize your job is the boss. To take care of everybody. Mm-hmm. You're not here just to boss you around and sit back and smoke a cigar. You'll get fired pretty soon and your business will go down the drain. That's not, that is corrupt power. That is corrupt holding of the master position where you're not taking care of the surrender position. Any person who holds the master position worth their salt is serving. Now, we have too much in the idea of corrupt power. People in the master position do have more power. But if the power is being well used, it is being used in the service of the people like that. that you have power over. It's a very democratic process. They have put you in charge. They have given you the power because putting you in power is to their benefit. This is why we elect the people we elect. So dominant self is only an erotic archetype. I would say it's clear to keep it, it in the erotic realm. That makes it very clear. It is clear to keep it in your erotic get off, in your erotic template, in your bedroom, in your dungeon. Don't bring it all over the place. It's confusing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bring the master surrender position and you'll be much, much more clearly. Mm-hmm. And everything that applies to master surrender position applies to the down sub, which is very clarifying. Down sub is simply a subset Set. of master surrender. But everything that applies to down sub does not apply to master surrender. Mm-hmm. So you could say metaphorically, the musicians are doming the audience. And it kind of rings true. Are the, the speaker is doming the listeners. Yeah, but you're gonna go off the rails very quickly. It's better not to use that language. It's better to say who is in the master position and how are they serving from that position? Mm-hmm. What I mean? What are some of the other and, dynamics? From, ma- from Dom and Sub, did you not apply to Master Sub serving? Well, I would say Dom and Sub is an erotic template, and Master uh, Surrender applies to everything and anything. So when Master Surrender applies to your erotic realm, you can take it into Dom and Sub. Okay. It's a subset. Yeah. Any questions? Mm-hmm. I have uh, two more pages. We're not going to read them. You're all going to feel them out. These are the agreements I've made for the Master and the Surrender position. Specifically for uh, stroking partners, but uh, you can use them and apply them in other ways. Any other questions on any of the topics we talked about? Is this conversation it? useful to you at all? Does it make sense? Yes. Very useful. I, I felt a really need for it because I teach BDSM, I teach people down sub archetypes, but I see a lot of confusion around down and sub, and people really use them liberally, and I find that using them liberally is actually not a good idea. Keep the down sub dynamic to your erotic realm. And also because people think, people don't have an idea of when, if the Dom is receiving, then the Dom must be uh, becoming a submissive. I'm like, actually, that's not true. You're creating more confusion. It's like a different distinction is needed. A Dom can be in the master position when he or she is active, and the Dom can also be in the surrender position when receiving service. And more importantly, the submissive starts off oftentimes in the surrender position. But if you only stay in the surrender position, it's half the journey. A submissive should know how to hold the master position and pour that energy back. And that is an art that is truly missing from a world. I agree. 
a masterful submissive, an active and serving masterful submissive is rare. Even people who do this uh, play don't understand it a lot of the times. Can you, what does that look like? That it looks like piece? service. It looks like knowing your dom. It looks like appreciating your dom. It looks like appreciating how much energy, how much skill, how much mastery, how much time your dom pours into you yeah. as a submissive, into taking you on rides, into creating experiences for you, into yeah. having acquired all this training that serves you and creates fun for you, yeah. and knowing I want to return that energy and return that energy in any shape and form that makes the dom's life better. It doesn't have to look like any particular thing. You, could, I, you can be a submissive who does his or her dom's taxes. You could be a submissive who is the dom's lawyer. You could be a submissive who comes and rubs the dom's feet because that's what the dom enjoys. But you are interested in this balancing of energies that is going back and forth. You are appreciating how much your dom is making your life better. And you want to return that energy and make your dom's life equally better because of you. Your dom's life is better because of you, just as your life as a submissive is better because of all the skill and energy and time the dom pours into you. Simple as that. It's really not rocket science, but it's kind of gotten lost. Yeah. These yeah, days. Does that make sense? Yes. Any other questions? Yes. I guess how would a someone in the submissive position, if they feel like they may be wanting to serve out of like, there was something I read in there, it's like um, pattern and, and pain. Yeah. Like if they're just serving like, oh, I'm feeling bad about myself, so I want to put my energy into this, or <clears throat> versus when it feels different. Well, one is one is not great. The other one is kind of much better. I don't know. <laughs> what are you asking exactly? Like, imagine, imagine somebody going down on you out of obligation, and somebody going down on you because they really get off on it, and they really, really want to get you off. Is there any comparison between the two? Night and day. Right. Which one would you rather have? Right. Someone who's good at it somebody who wants to do it for you because they enjoy it. But it's a crucial factor. You shouldn't do it for somebody else. Mm -hmm. If you're making a dinner party and you would hate cooking and you're hosting Thanksgiving, your turkey's going to be better mm -hmm. than somewhere else. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you enjoy cooking, like I fucking love Thanksgiving. I love creating it. Then I wake up at 5 a.m. and start. People do. <laughs> People do. Right? Eyes from scratch. 5 a.m. You get off on it, you serve people, and you love to see them happy and eat. That's like a great day. Mm -hmm. And the same thing applies in sex. And you know, you want a dom who actually is age <laughs> rope is doing it just to please you? No. Mm -hmm. Neither do you want a submissive who is doing the service to you that they hate doing or indifferent to, or doing it out of a sense of obligation. Obligation is not great. What do I mean? It's yucky. Yeah. So, does that answer? Yeah, it does. Okay. Anything else? Stopping? Mm -hmm. All right.